Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Garb August, the BookTube event to, to end all BookTube events. <laughs> this is created by Ollie at Criminali last year, designed to celebrate trash, reading and enjoying of good, juicy trash. <laughs> and uh, we had a blast last year. I was honored to be asked to be one of the co-hosts last year. I was honored to be asked again this year. Uh, and we have doubled our number of hosts and had a ton of new viewpoints coming in with all kinds of garbage in the month of August. Sadly, Garb August is coming to an end. Slowly but surely, we are getting to an end. The end of this week is the end of this month. Uh, but that still leaves me time to do plenty of garbage reading between now and then. So I've been adding uh, trash to my nightly reading. And I've lately been focusing on the cheap paperbacks that I got over the course of the year in anticipation of Garb August. I figured, why wait? You got them for this purpose. So I, I threw one of those on the pile for last night. This is by Robert Moore Williams, and it is Jongor of the Lost Land. I don't know um, whether or not this is a Frank Frazetta cover. It might be. Uh, you've got Jongor there in the front, and there is a non-monstrous woman there that, that is... Uh, our, one of our main characters, Anne Hunter, uh, who's a kind of an airhead socialite. And I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, I'm not 100% sure what's going on on that cover. The main thing, aside from the, you know, the hollowed out black eyes, the main thing that leads me to think it's a Frazetta cover is that I think there's a sexual subtext to it that is true in lots of Frazetta covers. I don't know quite what is happening to John Gore there, but you could tell right away when you're looking at this cover what kind of a book this is. I think this came out in the 1940s, and it is, uh, Anne Hunter ends up accidentally in a lost world in Australia, uh, but a very typical Edgar Rice Burroughs type lost world that has uh, monstrous subhuman creatures like these on the cover, it has dinosaurs, it has gigantic insects, it has gigantic everything, uh, Big, brawling, huge weather events. It's just a monstrous place. A place where if you put a, a sweet, delicate tenderfoot down in that place, she wouldn't last 15 minutes. They always manage to. They always manage to go stumbling through the forest. And uh, when in scenes like that, when the, the, long, the young Anjou is just barely surviving until she needs to be rescued by the hero, invariably she needs to be rescued from a lion or a Tyrannosaurus Rex or something like that. When, in actuality, it would be the insect life that would kill her, and it would kill her quickly. And there wouldn't be anything that, that you know, the gigantic brawny hero could do if he showed up on the screen, on the scene. He could, you know, maybe knock, knock a couple of giant scarab beetles off her, but not a hundred. Uh, he couldn't knock them off himself, either. All he could do is flee. Uh, but, uh, you know what you're getting right away. In a book like this, and I, I don't think I think I have an ebook collection of John Gore stories that I've never got to. One of those big ebook omnibus things, but uh, I don't think I'd ever read any John Gore before. Now I don't even remember seeing this book on the spinner rack back, you know, in the fifties or the sixties. I don't remember ever. See, I, I see it in used bookstores. I don't remember ever seeing it in the wild, and uh, I don't know anything about the author. It's been my my pattern with Garb August is really, if I can, to go in blind about the author. Uh, this wasn't good. <laughs> this was genuinely trash. Uh, I want to give you a sense of that. I will give you a, a little a little taste of uh, the kind of trash that I dealt with. The the good thing about trash, as you're learning if you're doing Garb August, is that uh, you're over and done with it in no time at all. Trash that takes you a long time. You should discard. <laughs> Absolutely. You go, it, it, trash is a nice, quick reading experience. And the bad thing is that it's like fast food. Fast food also takes no time to prepare and no time to eat, but you really suffer for it. <laughs> In the aftermath, you really suffer for it. You know that you've consumed something that's bad for you. Uh, it's just the guilty pleasure of trash, I guess. But let's, let's, uh, let's look in on Anne and see how she's doing. She has been rescued by John Gore a couple of times now. He's not much for words. Uh, he's actually not a savage barbarian. He's actually a, civ a man from her world, from civilization, who has gone native. He's gone wild in this lost world. If that's ringing any bells, well, we'll get back to that. Uh, but in, like I mentioned, in addition to the giant animals that are everywhere, there's also weather that needs to be dealt with. Uh, 
And in this scene, if I remember correctly, I read this last night, but I'm already trying to plot it from my memory. If I remember correctly, this in this scene, she and John Gore are fleeing from a gigantic storm, a tornado that is chasing them, I guess, for some reason. Uh, so this is, this, let's see here, to Anne, fleeing furtively from the tornado that seemed to know where they were, it seemed that night would never come. Behind her, sounding clearly through the growing dusk, was the monstrous gnawing roar of the twister. It seemed as if the tornado literally ate its way through the grove of trees. As they moved along the edge of the swamp, the roar continued behind them. Often Anne stumbled and fell, but each time John Gore lifted her to her feet. Now he stopped hastily at the sight of something on the ground and quickly sought another trail. If you were brought up short by stopping hastily, so was I. <laughs> I think the author was just thinking, maybe I've used the word abruptly too many times in this book. So I'm not going to use it now, <laughs> but you you actually can't stop hastily. <laughs> but that's, uh, anyway, uh, Anne saw the, the thick rope-like body lying coiled. Jongor avoided it. Terror began to mount in her. Up until this moment, she had not thought of snakes. <laughs> After she saw the coiled snake, Jongor had to carry her. <laughs> I guess she just swooned. <laughs> Eventually, the roar began to die down. When this happened, Anne insisted on walking again, only to discover that she had no strength left in her legs. What's she been doing with them? Eventually? So what, did she have this guy carry her like a sack of crap for an hour? <laughs> because she saw a snake? She's never seen a snake before? Uh, that night, had fi the night had finally come. Jongor was a shadow in the darkness. Near her, she could barely make out Ofer and Varsi. Don't worry. In fact, you'd be grateful that you don't know. I can't go any farther, she said to John Gore. I simply can't. You haven't gone anywhere, sister. <laughs> he carried you for who knows how long. Well, as long as it took for a storm to subside. And even after then, you said your legs were useless. So we presume that all the way until nightfall, he's still carrying you. Uh, I can't go any farther, she said to John Gore. I simply can't. But you can go on. Save yourself. Don't worry about me. Privately, she knew she was on the verge of a complete physical and emotional collapse. She could hear Hofer and Varsi panting for breath, and she knew they were as close to exhaustion as she was. Only Jongor seemed to have strength. If you can go on no farther, neither will I, he said. But you must go on, the girl insisted. My problems are not your problems. Mr. Hofer and Mr. Varsi will stay with me. I doubt if they will be much help, Jongor said. The young woman was very tired. In addition, she was so badly frightened that fear had ceased to have any meaning for her. In the darkness, the whirlwind was still muttering to itself. She thought it was not coming nearer, but she was not sure. You needn't sneer at these men, she said to John Gore. They are my friends. I wasn't sneering at them, John Gore answered. However, you might as well face the truth about them. Varsi is a weakling and a coward. Hofer is no weakling. On the other hand, he is dangerous and deadly. Both of these men are using you for purposes of their own. And of course she says, that's not true. <laughs> and... <sighs> And if you're sensing, well, okay, he's the one bolt of nobility, he's endlessly, he's endlessly strong, he knows this natural world, he knows all of its natural dangers, uh, he's from the civilized world and has come here to put on a loincloth and cry to the moon, well, if you're thinking all that sounds familiar, yes, this is a Tarzan pastiche novel. Only Tarzan was probably heavily guarded copyright, so Jongor was born. He has the exact same origin story as a million other Tarzan knockoffs. In the comic books, it would be Kazar, among many others. And that's all he acts like. He just acts like a bargain basement Tarzan. Uh, I don't know that I knew that about Jongor, but it, it isn't. you're not ten pages into the book before you realize that's what you're getting. And I'm not, I'm not averse to that. I have read many, many start, uh, Tarzan pastiche fictions. I've even written one of my own on fanfiction.net. Uh, and I have a sweet tooth for them. Absolutely, I will take them. In fact, I'm on record many, many times in print and here on YouTube saying that I really wish that Edgar Rice Barbers Incorporated in Tarzana, California was masterminding a booming business in ERB pastiche. Instead of not doing that. Instead of not doing that. There should be 50 Tarzan pastiche novels. There should be 150 John Carter pastiche novels. Who knows what a really talented science fiction author or, could do with Carson of Venus? Who knows? We'll never know, because Edgar Rice Powers Incorporated just does not seem to want to know. They authorize what? Uh, Michael K. Vaughn would know better than I do. I know they have the, their, their, their authorized Tarzan novels, 
with newly commissioned cover artwork. And they also do a fair amount of authorizing of uh, comic books. But novels? No. Uh, so I, I, I would welcome that. So I'm obviously not against Tarzan pastiche fiction, but this was very much pastiche fiction. It didn't do anything. There's pastiche fiction and there's pastiche fiction, right? Some pastiche fiction is gamesome. It wants to push the boundaries of its beloved property. Plenty of original of authors of original material recognize that that playfulness in pastiche fiction is the ultimate expression of love. They don't feel like their creation is being violated. If it's not being violated, they don't feel that way. You don't need to stick to just the same old, same old. This book does. The other kind of pastiche fiction just does that. You want this kind of pattern. I'm going to barely reheat it in the microwave and I'm going to serve it up to you. Uh, did John Gore ever have hardcovers? Uh, was John Gore serialized first before books? Uh, did this paperback do well? I have no idea. One way I can, one thing I can tell you about this paperback that I haven't been able to say about many books in Garbagas is that this little paperback did not do well in the reading experience. Uh, it is, it is falling apart. There are whole blocks of pages that are coming out. I think one is, yeah, this thing is just, just loose. That's the, the beginning of chapter eight. Woman. You were going to jump! John Gore's voice was hot with accusation. And Lay and John Gore's arms both were panting for breath. <laughs> I know that sounds interesting, but believe me, it's not. <laughs> uh, yeah, this thing is would never take another read. Fortunately, I'm not going to give it another read under any circumstances. I'll be on to greener pastures next Garb August. So what I will do, what I usually do when these old paperbacks start to fall apart, I will remove the cover and keep the cover as a keepsake and then just just dump the book because the, the book is is not readable again so uh but i don't know how many people reread john gore i'll have to look around and see if i have an ebook but i doubt i will return to this world this was boring it was boring now uh it was boring and also charmless and i'm perfectly willing to say that some edgar rice Burroughs tarzan novels are boring that is true. It, it's it's a minor bit of heresy, but I bet even Michael K. Vaughn would agree that some of them are boring. Some of them are dull. You can only take so many 30-page chapters devoted to the inner thoughts of the Arab villain of the week before you start to long for Tantor to just come crashing through the underbrush and crush them all. <laughs> uh, but they're never charmless. When you are reading a Tarzan novel, even when you could wish for a little more action... You know you're reading something amazing. You know you're reading Pulp of the Absolute First Water. And I think a large part of that attaches to the fact that it's original. That, that it's the source of all these knockoff novels. It's, it's the original. The original can falter now and again, but it's still the one. It still started the whole thing. Um, and that made me think for Garb August, which is not a good idea. It's not a good combination. <laughs> You're not supposed to think during August, the dog days of August. You're not supposed to think during Garb August. But it made me think uh, about what that particular element is. What would we even call it that absolutely immunizes the original and against whose rocks the pastiches crash and sink? What is that element? We could talk about this with Tarzan pastiche fiction, or we could talk about it with Conan pastiche fiction. Uh, because we are headed out of Garb August and into the ultimate soft landing of a sequential event. We're headed into Sumerian September. Conan in September. Conan has had a million imitators. Not maybe in since Conan's stories came out, maybe as many imitators as Tarzan. And yet... The exact same thing applies, I think. I think that no Conan pastiche fiction has the particular, that particular glint of magic that the Conan originals do. The idea of Sumerian September is that in the, in the single month of September, if you wanted to, 30 pages a day, you could read all of Robert E. Howard's Conan. And you are strongly encouraged to. I <laughs> strongly encourage this, this great volume right here. Just dig into this thing and read the whole thing. Uh, that was on my mind. That's been on my mind about Conan because I've been I've been doing a lot of reading of Conan comic books lately and wondering 
what is the difference here? Much as I might be enjoying these things, they don't have the spark of magic that is in all the originals. So what is the difference between the original and the pastiche fiction? You can't say it's the level of talent. With Tarzan... Uh, or with Conan. <laughs> it's a little bit of dicey ground there, but I would argue that in terms of... Uh, oh God, I'm going to get into trouble here, definitely. With Michael K. Vaughn, at least, I'm going to get into trouble. I would argue that some Conan pastiche novels were written by people who are better writers than Robert E. Howard. Uh, and we don't have many Tarzan pastiche novels, but when we get something close... Philippe Jose Farmer wrote a, a pastiche of Tarzan that doesn't name Tarzan, but it is very close. It is much better written. I, I don't think it has anything to do with the quality of the writer. I think it has to do with something else, and I haven't quite put my finger on what that something else is. But when you write a pastiche novel of a one-dimensional figure, like Conan or Tarzan, when you write a pastiche novel of a one-dimensional figure, and it lacks that magic, what you get is trash. <laughs> It was enjoyable. This is very enjoyable trash. I kept wondering what was going to happen to John Gore next. That's the whole point of a book like this. And we've seen in my own Garbogist uh, journey in 2023 that that isn't always the case. So I count this today's trash pickup as a win. <laughs> I read. I finally read a John Gore novel. I don't think I've ever read them before. Uh, but I, I think this is the first one. So <laughs> I've got a little John Gore in my system now. I'm immunized. <laughs> but anyway, that's my trash pickup for today. Just a few more Garb August visits until the month is over. I'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.